morning, everybody. Come on, buddy. You know what? You take your time. Uh, so anyway, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I've been asked to uh, speak at uh, my friend Paul's live event, and he he it's gonna be at a park. He has people coming up from like Georgia and stuff like that. So it's gonna be interesting. I'll be in the minority as far as the as the racial spectrum goes. It's gonna be foreign to me, but. He asked me to speak at his event, so I don't say no to these things when people ask me to do them. And I also got to be less enthusiastic, as, at least in the moment while I portray this. He's asleep. It's like 3 in the morning. Anyway, um, my goal is that we... I'm going to answer a couple questions that people had. So I asked around, like... And things that I'm going to myself. I'm going to title this seeing yourself through God's lens. So I want to talk about, not only about, my goal is to have no notes, so that way I can interact with people better. So we're going to talk a little bit about the image of God. The image of God means, even people I know that haven't read the Bible and understand that we are made in the image of God, they at least have heard that statement. So we're going to talk about that. What does that mean? We're going to talk about the, uh, Words, that's something that's, and, and John describes Christ himself. He says, and he was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. So words seem pretty important. We're going to talk about the concept of love. Hello. Like what love is, specifically in the Greek language, which most of the New, New Testament scriptures are, are uh, written in. And then we'll talk about Christ and the personification of all that the foundation of it there's a, a parable and, and some of the stuff if you've watched the stuff on my philosophy channel I'll be repeating but it's okay <coughs> it's um you know all this kind of stuff kind of synergizes so and it's worth reviewing if anything from my own mind yeah um, he, he didn't even jump up here and he's purring cat so Christ tells a story of this parable about the wise man building his house upon rock and the foolish man building his house upon the sand and when the storms came one of the rocks stood firm one on the sand well it was obliterated and great was his destruction so this is actually something that Nietzsche talked about as well if you don't know who Nietzsche is he's a guy that coined the frame God is dead and he had extreme critiques of Christianity um, the idea is like uh, my wife got me this book called the Jesus through Palestinian eyes you go and ask them uh, when they build a house, they will say, every time you build it down to the rock. The reason I say that is because during the summertime, it's hard. Although the ground is hard. It's, you can't get down to it unless you really work. During the wintertime, it's all slushy and muddy. So if you try digging a hole during the wintertime when it's easy, it'll just fill in. You need rock to be your foundation, whether it be like 10 feet or 20 feet, doesn't matter. So you have to dig when it's hard. It's hardest down to the rock because that's where you get your foundation the idea is that in that in that parable I believe is that you dig as far as you possibly can to make sure where you are is stable true because you want to if you want to know what you know and you want to know that there's, there's nothing that's going to shake it because there are storms in this life Nietzsche had the same kind of philosophy he said he would philosophize with a hammer looking for something he couldn't destroy. And as far as he was concerned, and I agree with him, there's only one, ever one true Christian, Christ. We try to aim that direction, but fail constantly. So the image of God, like, what does that mean? Well, in the beginning, Genesis 1, I'd have my Bible there, I don't have it, it's in the room back there, but I started already. In the beginning, the world was void and without form, and the Spirit hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So later on, when he creates man, he said he made man in the image of God. Man and woman, he created them in the image of God. So as far as I can tell, this is as far back as you can go. And this is there's a lot of layers to this. It's amazingly sophisticated. 
if you go with Moses writing the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, um, then you'll understand he's trying to talk with the people who have been indoctrinated in Egyptian culture for 400 years. That's, that's kind of a lens you had to look, got to look through this as well. So what he does is he, you have the spirit hovering over the water. So it's like stirring. It's like a mass potential. It's infinite potential or chaos, but it's also purposelessness. It's like a, if everything was a jungle, then nothing's a jungle. A jungle, jungle compared to what? It's just all the same thing. There's no, nothing that defines it, nothing that's distinct. And then God says, let there be. He says, let there be light. And it's interesting and also amazing that it says light. If you know anything, it's a little bit about the theory of relativity. Coming up, he's made a decision here. The theory of relativity, uh, light, time itself is impossible without light. So this also makes sense when God creates light before he creates the sun, at least in the order of progression in the book. And I think it's more poetic than that. And it kind of goes, if you look at uh, specifically the word yom, yom means day. So in that day he created. It doesn't say first, second, third, on the fourth day. It says the next day he created. So on this day he did this, on this day he did this. And it has a bouncing of like down to up, kind of like a little dualism. But it's not dualistic because there's no there's a force there's an agency controlling all of this too so that's where you get the trinitarian aspect but that's besides the point so he says let there be it creates time time itself and that's as far as i can tell that's the image of god now is that the image of god well that's reality itself like matter everything and then you can look at that as like that's the spirit that is literally the spirit hovering over the waters it's reality and you have god the abstract law, the eternal law, and the future pulling reality to itself. And in the middle, you get life. And that's Christ. Christ is in the middle. He is literally life itself. And so that you have the feminine, which is the spirit, reality itself. The masculine, which is the father, the future, pulling it to itself. And in the middle, you have life and observance and that's where we are we're in the middle we're the life we're, we're the conscious force that obs is observing that interaction between reality and law and it's law enacted properly if anything it's because you know we have different laws here right we have different laws that are eternal in physics that just keep working no matter what law of mathematics right so the law of gravity works a specific way. The law of magnetism works a specific way on specific things. The law of light does not apply to matter. It might affect it, but it doesn't apply to it. The law of magnetism doesn't apply to thermodynamics. It might affect it, but it doesn't apply to it. This is the, the masculine dealing with the feminine properly. It's like ext extracting out specific meaning in a specific way. This is like, and this is the concept of the masculine and the feminine working out properly is amazingly sophisticated and historical. Um, for instance, if you have in Saudi Arabia, they had amazing explosion of sophistication in mathematics and science in like the 12th century until Sharia law came into play. Once Sharia law was enforced and the feminine was basically uneducated, covered head to toe, it's like growth stopped. There's no growth. You can't have growth without the feminine. That's where life comes from. And then you have... In America, it's like the contrast of that, right? Feminine is desacralized. It's just anything can be a woman if it wants to be. Or her beauty is exposed to everybody. It's not special. It's not sacred anymore. It's pornography on the internet. For lack of a better word. Is there any wonder why there's confusion of gender, etc., in our country? So that's improper use of the feminine, both ways, and both are extreme. Some some kind of balance in the, in the middle. Now, there's a lot of this whole concept of of Adam and Eve. How you how you apply Adam and Eve to creation itself? Like we we as people embody this. It takes a, it takes a quite a bit to unpack, but I want to get to other things. 
I just want to say it's 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 amazingly tied into that specifically when you get to like so Adam goes to sleep when he's looking for somebody comparable to him and then Eve is extracted out of Adam now that's really weird doesn't don't people come from women not men that's kind of interesting but it, but words are words are kind of neat itself now I'm, I'm i'm hopping hold on i'll go back i'll go back to that in a second but words when you're looking at words like if you look at an object like here we go cup right but do i see the word cup no i see something that holds liquid but i apply cup to that definition it's like a shortcut in your mind i see everything it possibly could be and I had, there's like a hierarchy of meaning right this whole it's coffee specifically, but it holds liquid. It's a cup. It's something that holds liquid. And then you could say, okay, it's white, and you could add all these other definitions to it. But the, the, the pinnacle, the peak of it, it's something that holds liquid that I can hold in my hand, maybe. And then I apply that word to cup. I extract out the, the highest meaning of it. It's, it's different when you meet a person. When you meet a person like Michael. Like, what's your name? My name is Michael. It's the opposite then. I know not, I know a couple of Michaels, but this is a different one. So I see this person. This person's different. I don't see Michael and immediately know a hierarchy of things. Human being, sure, but that's not a person. A person's different. There's a different appliance to this. I see him, and I only know the definitions by relationship. I have to discover the definition while interacting with it. It's something known. Every single person is like an unknown creature. So when you have Adam and Eve, Adam, uh, there's ancient stories where Adam is like hermaphroditic. I mean, see, you know, the masculine and the feminine are in Adam himself. So what does Adam mean? Adam means earth. That's, that's the, what Adam means. That's the definition of Adam. So when Adam, there's a, there's a, there's a couple layers to this. And I'll, I'll try to go over a couple of them. When Adam is looking for somebody like himself. He only looks. He can only look within because he sees things so foreign to him outside of himself. So that's where the interaction is. That's where the propagation of the species would be within. He's the masculine and the feminine interactions within. So what God, <coughs> for me, God does, he pulls out Eve from Adam. So the interaction is now in reality itself. He has to react with reality. But there's another part of that too, and that's. You know, he, God looks at Adam and he extracts out the highest pinnacle of what Adam is, which is Eve. And this is where it gets kind of tricky because the feminine, very difficult to describe. It's like, you know what it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sort of. So what is Eve to Adam? Well, first off, she's agency and compulsion. She... You, you pursue her. She's something worthy of pursuit because life itself is inside of her. That's sacred and that's special. She's vulnerable, sure. She's caring. She's, uh, she's empathetic. Um, children get their definition through Eve's eyes. We have these things called mirror neurons. The mom smiles. The baby smiles. Literally, the person comes from the woman. And uh, kids that are detached from their mothers have a very, a trouble time doing, uh, dealing with this, especially early on. They need feminine attachment. That's where, that's where like emotion itself is defined, you know, properly. You get this, uh, this intimate touch. And I heard, I think I heard a guy from Belgium describe it like this: like the the reason why they take the man's last name is because. Children are physically attached to the woman, but they don't. They're, they need to be spirit, spiritually attached to the man, so they take the man's last name, and that that kind of makes sense, right? Because they have this this kind of store gay relationship and that ties it with love with, when it comes to creation. Now, that's that's the masculine and the feminine working together. This is male and female, and this this is again back in Genesis where you have the spirit over the waters, and you have God saying, "Let there be," and the interaction. Between those two is life itself properly. So then we have Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the Bible is to know. They're intimate. That's eros. 
It's another version of love in Greek. It means to know. And so the interaction of the masculine and the feminine, he extracts out properly from her the right way, because she could say no. Women are the gatekeepers of relationships. If you don't handle the feminine properly, she, she will say no properly. We're not talking about violation or perversion. And the interaction between the masculine and the feminine becomes life. A new child. So I mentioned Eros and I mentioned Storge. Um, in the Greek, they have four versions of love. They have Eros, Agape, Storge, and Phileo. Eros being romantic love. Storge is parental love. Usually the love of a parent or mother to a child. Agape is the other way. It's like fatherly love. This way it goes out and up. Phileo is the love of a brother. Now, I really like how the Greeks unpack this because in, the, we have, in, in English we have one word for love, and that's love. It's like, I love my car. Well, good job. <laughs> Do you also love your wife the same way? Well, no. There's, there's differences there. You know, proper ways to interact with things you love. And so, in, in every form of love, it starts with compulsion or agency, and it ends with duty, an act of will, every single one. So, in Eros, the intimate love, you have you know, intimate relationship, you are you, to know. That was the name of it in the Hebrew. So Adam knows Eve, and life comes out of it. It's intimate, and that's the compulsion part of it. And then the duty part of it is you take responsibility for your family. Properly, that's how things work. And storge, the love of a parent to a child. So that's an infant. You are infinitely significant to that tiny child. They need you. And you're almost you're compelled to take care of them. It's like your responsibility, your duty, and your pride and everything else. We haven't had a child. It's very difficult to understand this. But it becomes a different part of your life. As far as I can tell, no one really grows up until they have a child. Once someone in your life is more important than you are, and you work for them, well, that's becoming a servant. That's, that's the son of man. It says you must be, if you want to become the greatest, you become a servant to your fellow man. Storge, roughly, is the most intimate as it could possibly be in the family structure. So that's the compulsion. You're, in, you, you're infinitely, you basically have charge of that child's life until you rear them. And the act of will is you have to let them go. You have to, once they are a certain age, let them go. You're no longer responsible. That's tough. And that's feminine courage because you're basically offering your child to the world to be sacrificed because you know what's going to happen. Not a single, there's a 100% fatality rate in the entire planet. Everybody dies. And they will no longer be there for you to keep them safe. So you have to let them go. Then you have phileo. Phileo is brotherly love. And that's you and your brother or sister sharing the same aim. Right? You're, but you're together and you agree and you kind of you, you go together the same direction. It's honor. If you ever share, if you ever face bullets with another man together, you are bound to them. You share that experience. That's awesome. Like it, barring, again, barring perversion, you are inseparable. That's phileo. That's like you're working together for a common cause that's greater than you. That's good. That's compulsion. That's like, you know, you and a buddy are there and suddenly someone starts comes in your place and starts beating up the place. Well, you and your brother together, let's, we got to stop that. It's a common enemy. Or you're, you're, you're trapped in the wilderness. You have to figure out a way to survive. There's another human there. Let's work together and do this. Okay, yeah, we got this. That's the compulsion. The act of will comes. Okay, we're meeting the same aim. But will I give my life for that person so that aim is met? That's an act of will. Christ says, oh, a person might give their life for a good man, but no one will give their life for a sinner. Something like that. So that's an act of will. You have to will yourself to the point where that aim, that's the Trinitarian aspect as well. You love God first, then you love your neighbors yourself. That's phileo. So I can tell. Then you have agape. Agape is love to a parent. And the way that starts is you, you have an ideal. You can have this now. It doesn't have to be a parent. Someone you idolize. Someone you aim at. I want to be like them. 
And that's compulsion. That's, that gives you something. That gives you purpose. That gives you something to align yourself to. That's the agency. That's the compulsion. The act of will comes. Sometimes I have to do something I don't want to do. To aim that direction. Sometimes you have to live a certain way you don't feel like doing. And you have to, like, violate your feelings in order to do it. To aim that direction. There's a lot of things that God says, thou shalt not do for our benefit. But the flesh says, no, I really feel like doing it. So that's the act of will. That's where it comes in. And that's love, compact in four different ways. I think it's really sophisticated. C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, is really good. It comes to uh, really describing that. He unpacks it a lot better. So what does love have to do with Christ? Well, the thing about the Christian story we, we talked about the image of God, words itself and meaning specifically, and, and words in their, have a relationship with the person, with consciousness. And, but that relationship is also kind of reflective on the loves. And the way you get a relationship is by is through story. And so one of the, the greatest stories ever written, as far as I can tell, and ever will be written, it's archetypical. It's, you can't write better or worse story than Christ. Christ's story. <coughs> the way you do that is when you look at the story and you look at what happened to the guy. I mean, he's, he's as far as I can tell, this, the son of God. So what does that mean? He's, 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 he's doing love in all the proper ways, every single way, all those ones I just unpacked. So, but you are also in that story. You are not Christ. You're, you're Pilate, you're Caiaphas. You're Peter, you're Paul, maybe you're Mary. And how do you see that? Well, maybe, maybe you're Pilate. Maybe you're a person who's skeptical of truth, but you'll follow the mob. Maybe you're Judas, and your version of perfection or savior doesn't look like the one that's given to you. Do so you have a different version of what perfection looks like? Maybe you're Peter, your will is so strong, it's not. You make so many vows, but you have to violate your own character. You, you need some sort of forgiveness because yourself, you literally get your character just wiped away by the, the trials of this planet. Maybe you're, uh, maybe you're Mary, demon-possessed one. And everybody knows a person like this. Either You either seek out drama or drama just follows you all the time. And you need help from that. That's a tough life. Some people have this cloud about them. That stuff always happens to them. It's always, it's not positive. Maybe it's brought on by yourself. Maybe it's just the curse of your life. Who knows? So maybe you're Mary. Maybe you're Mary in another sense. There's like versions of Mary here, but this is the feminine personified in Christ's story. Maybe you busy yourself so much with work that you don't want to think about serious things and eternal things. That's Mary in the kitchen saying, or Martha in the kitchen, sorry, it's not Mary, it's Martha, saying, hey, tell her to come help me. Christ, Mary's listening to Christ at that time, says she's chosen the greater thing. You're, you're busying yourself with so many things. You have to think about the eternal. And you can do that. Maybe you're Mary, point where the mother of Christ where you know your son or the person you are caring for is going to die sooner than you are. You're going to have to watch. That's, that's a heavy burden. No. But you're in that story. Everybody's in that story. Maybe you're Paul and you're so convicted and you have so much passion about what you think is right that you really need a spiritual slap in the face to figure out that now you're going the wrong direction listen to it because you don't have to you need to listen to truth what truth is and so what is truth um, we do ask that question right that was Pilate that's a politician asking what truth is but he doesn't even stick around for an answer he just walks away what is truth as far as I can tell I mean you can, you can spend hours talking about this but truth is when narrative and reality touch when you examine both of those then making sure what you're talking about is actually what's happening. Word, word reflects reality. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Again, at John 1.1, 1, 1, that's, that's, that's a 
definition of God himself, because every other word that we have needs other words to define it. Um, I mean, if, if you don't believe me, just watch Pokemon. They say their name, and that's it. And there's you can't understand what they're saying, even if they use some sort of emotional inflection upon the word. There's no language there. It's, it's like, I am Groot. Okay. What? <laughs> like, the, the mind does not work that way. You might be able to read emotion, like, screaming angrily, but that doesn't articulate a word. So language does not work that way. We need langu other languages. We need other words as a point of reference. Um, just say the same word one 100 times. You will start self-diagnosing that word. You're just not thinking about it. Because words and heart and mind are bound through language. So properly, you should be thinking about what you're saying. And when other people are talking, you should be, you know, your ver reverse mind reading. It's something like that. Anyway, words, words are important. So we see ourselves in that story, the story of Christ, and how he endures to the end. So what's that have to do with love? Well, every single bit of love, all four I unpacked, they start with the agency, and they end with force of will. Christ does all four of those. And the thing about the Bible is, it's, it's, it is the first book. So, like, what is education? Um, is, it, is it something you spend $100,000 on and go into debt just so you can have the same thing everybody else does? That's silly. Education. So what is education for? Education is so that you can live life and make the proper choices. Whether it is building a house there, you can build a house properly. It's architecture. Maybe it's um, plumbing. Now you can wire up your house to, you know, go to the bathroom properly. You know, educate and what is philosophy? Making sure you're thinking correctly and articulating your thoughts and not saying things that are incoherent. In culinary arts, you're making food properly. It's so you can live life properly, not so you can get a job. That's what education's for. It's for life to be lived properly. We're so caught up in the system that we forget this. Um, in the, the, when the schools were first founded in America, first off, God was part of every single one. But secondly, to get to get in to college, you had to be fluent in three languages and have competent knowledge of the Bible and of all ancient all ancient liter English literature. Shakespeare, Hamlet, Homer's Iliad. That's to get into college. So what do we do now? Yeah, you want to go down into into debt, take out all those loans? There you go. You can come into college. You basically become a slave. You're a slave to what? Like, in, you know what I mean? Like, so we, we forget this stuff. So when we educate ourselves properly on the book, on the that's my cat, on the book itself, the goal is to live life better. Isn't what's the point of knowing all these things? Not just to regurgitate them. It's because we want to pass it on to our children. Now that's in Deuteronomy, passing it on to our children, our children's children, because we want to make sure they know where they came from. We want to make sure. That they have a good foundation. One of the things that in the political spectrum they like to do, I think there's this quote, I think it's by Will, Woodrow Wilson, but I'm not sure, I don't think it is. Um, never waste a good crisis. Because you could take emotion, and, and what emotion does is it takes all your intellect and whoosh, makes you focus on a tiny little spot right here. Racism. It's a common one, sexuality. Why does God hate homosexuals? Nah. It's, it's focusing on something when the picture's way bigger. The only way that racism is wrong is if you believe people were made in the image of God and are given dignity by something greater than ourselves. Otherwise, why not be racist? What's the point? Because now we have the opposite, right? Let's pay reparations for, for white people. They were reparations. Well, that's, that's interesting. So it, we can work race the other way, but not this way. I mean, 5,000 years ago, it was the opposite. White people, white people are slave for blacks. That's the Ethiopians. Joseph was sold to them. It's something to think about. Like, you can, how far back are we going to go? To Adam and Eve? And that's where you get the men and women division. What's femi you have fe feminism and, and toxic masculinity. Are we going to hate each other? Like, how, how deep is our hatred going to go? Are we going to hate our very flesh? 
And eventually, you go back further and you, just, you can get your rage toward God for making things as they are. It's a different topic. So we know all these things. We educate ourselves. We, we see it first. We see ourselves in the image of God. We understand language, truth, marry truth. We marry narrative and reality. We engage in relationship with our fellow being properly. And that's all in the Bible, the way we do this. The Bible is the story of man. It's not the story of, it's not a how to live perfect book. It's showing that this is a fallen world. And we have Christ, who is the archetypical person, the person you aim at. That's the aim. Christ did all four of those loves perfectly. So, Eros, what is Eros? Eros is intimate love. He became flesh. He was intimate with his creation, literally became it. That's the compulsion. He was compelled to do this. He takes responsibility by living life start to finish. You're on the cross. You have agape. Agape is fatherly love. When he's 12, he's in the Jerusalem temple. He's gone for a day. Two days? I forget. I'm sorry. And then, well, they find him after they left and came back. He's in the temple. And they're it's like, did you know I not would not be about my father's business. That's compulsion. He's doing what he should do. And then the force of will comes when he has to be crucified. And he's in Gethsemane. And he's sweating blood. Not by my will, but yours. He has to go to the cross, and he knows he does, and he listens to his father even though he doesn't want to. It's agape. Storge, the love of a parent. He's with his twelve disciples, teaching them daily with them intimately. But he can't control them. Love does not compel. If you love, as a man, if you love a woman, really love her, and she does not return your affection, what do you do? Properly, you let her go. That's what you should do. And that's also a force of will. You have to accept the feminine saying no to you, because she's right. There's something wrong. Either she's already taken, there's something wrong with you to a point where she has, she's saying no. And you, that's when, that's, Eve giving Adam the apple. Like, because Eve is already self conscious. She has life itself inside of her. And then she, Eve makes Adam self conscious by giving him the apple. And he starts thinking about himself. And this is the, the judgment of the feminine, which is amazingly powerful. Um, I, I learned this a lot with reading Rory Miller's book, uh, Facing Violence. Um, at least one aspect of it is you. If, if there's a fight between men, it's one thing, it's called the monkey dance. It's establishing hierarchy. It becomes infinitely, not infinitely, but exponentially more violent and explosive if a woman is watching. Like every time. doesn't matter. She could be grandma, but specifically, you know, the ideal beauty figure that they may be not, not even fighting at. She's just watching. It's like the judgmental feminine is watching that. Storge, so Storge, he's with his he's with his uh, disciples, but eventually he has to let them make their decision. His love does not force, it might compel, but it doesn't force. So that's the act of will. You have to let your creation make their own choice. Storge. We have Phileo. Phileo is the aim. Christ is aimed at the Father the whole time. His brothers are with him. He gives his life. So we can continue on aim. It's agape, phileo, storge, and eros. Christ has all four of those loves, and that's our typical. We have to remember that like this, the book, the Bible, is, is what all these values in relationship to love and each other are established. And it took us, like, the things Christ said were just amazingly, they were so cool. Had, and should we raise the Son of God? Like, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, given a God what is God's. 1,700 years later, 1,800 years later, you have separation of church and state. It took us that long to figure that out, that that's actually a good thing. Get government out of our religious bracket. That's not good for anybody. It's eventually, government will, that's the world. The, the, 
It's like the, the fence around the world that, that makes society work. You put that force and law into religion, putting law into religions. It's, it's, a, it's a very shaky thing. There's certain, in society, there's certain things you can't violate in order to, you know, live. That's why we have, like, the death penalty. It's why we have, well, <laughs> like, sir, the pedophiles get destroyed in prison. Like, even prisoners know you don't mess with kids. That's, that's our innocent identity. But anyway, that's, I actually went beyond the scope of, of what I was going to prep for. I should have ended at the, at the store gate thing. But that, that's it. That's all I, that's all I wanted to say. And I was actually kind of trying to time myself, too. So about a half hour was pretty good. Because on every four of those topics, I've given talks before. And I went, I did an hour on every topic. So I'm glad I didn't go four hours. That would have been ridiculous. But anyway, thanks for watching. That's that's all I got, really. Oh, well, thank you, Bacon. I appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, I have a... Um, I have a... If you look up Heart and Mind Coffee Talks, I've got a philosophy channel. I'm slowly up, uploading and, and putting all my uh, talks. I put on my gaming channel, which you know, really stuck, and that's okay. Over there, well, I mean, this this is talk. I'll hopefully be doing tomorrow. I'll try to audio record it. It's always because I, I want to have Q and A after, but who knows? Like we can have discussion after. It's it's you know it's a point of education, so you you make correct decisions and live life better. Uh, let's see if I can just find a link here real quick for it. Just do a YouTube. There it is. Got a picture of Nietzsche right there. Seven subscribers. Boom. So I, have, I think I have I have a bunch of videos uploaded there, but I have um one come out Wednesday and then one come out Sunday. I think up to like June. I'm gonna start adding new stuff to it. That's it. Anyway, I think it'll do it. Thanks for watching. I'm going to go drink some more coffee and study my notes better. I know I left a lot of things out, but that's okay. I'm trying to, and this is, like, right now, my the person I'm kind of aiming at as far as a, the agape sense of it, right, is the, uh, the Jordan Peterson. Not everything he says, I don't, he's, he's not my, just like Trump, right? I'll vote for him, but he's not my ideal figure. But uh, the concept, the, the couple of things I learned from Jordan Peterson is, like, you, you, you learn to give talks without notes so you can interact with people better. So that's what that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Anyway, see you guys later. Take